everyone. We're resuming the Wednesday, August 15th, uh, 2018 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Call the meeting back to order. And I'd ask everyone to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A roll call, please. Councilor Bebine? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Present. Uh, Councilor Katarina is uh, away uh, and will join us again at the next meeting. Uh, general public comments, uh, because our uh, work session ran for a full hour and a half. I hope people who came for uh, the workshop would take the opportunity and, and wanted to provide us with public comment would take the opportunity to do so at this time. So uh, the uh, microphone is open. Thank you. Any, uh, any public comment? Susan? Susan Hamill, uh, Bay Street and Pine Point. I would just like to ask that you um, post the, if you're able to, post the, uh, the slides that were um, shown tonight, as well as, um, as the material becomes available, to please <coughs> post it on either the council website or whatever is appropriate. Um, it would be great to see some of the backup. Great, the good, uh, good suggestion. Uh, and, and we'll try to post the um, televised tape of it, uh, ASAP, so that people have the benefit of being able to uh, hear that presentation. Other comments? Uh, not to make, that's, my name's Don Hamill, I'm on uh, Pine Point. Uh, and, and it doesn't make, I don't mean to make this seem like it's a, you know, we're here together, my wife and I, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but here you are. Some date independent night. comments. Date night some independent date comments night. on a related topic. Two, two things. One is, uh, in response to the, uh, to the presentation we saw tonight, it's a lot. Uh, and I uh, applaud the efforts of the counselors uh, to be quick on their feet, to respond with good questions, and to point out the difficulties with absorbing that much information in little to no time. Uh, and, and, didn't, and as I understand it, you didn't see anything ahead of time. So uh, we feel your pain. You know, we're exactly where you are, and that's without a lot of information. And we follow this stuff fairly closely. And we have other hobbies. We do have other hobbies. <laughs> um, but uh, th this is troubling. It's a consistent pattern. And we're in a phase uh, of the town's growth where we're looking at huge issues and huge decisions involving huge amounts of money. And we need to take the time necessary to do the due diligence, to study the details, to help the public get engaged and understand what we're talking about, and have them be partners in the process, and it's not happening. So that's my comment about, um, about the TIFs. And another thing I'd like to say about that are the ones that we've done so far, we gotta take a good hard look at those. We've asked for data on those to give us a straight answer on how successful were they, and we're still trying to figure out the answers ourselves from a spreadsheet of data that, we, that we've received. We should understand you know, very well what went well and what didn't and try to understand what we can do better. And try to be realistic about what game we're playing. We're talking about an amount of money here, $150 million, which is many times fold more than the amount of money that we've ever considered in this game of TIFFs. So the good news is we're playing in the major leagues. Bad news is you know, our state of play maybe isn't major league play, and it needs to be. So the suggestion that was made by one of the counselors to get outside independent assistance to study this in detail and to have a full understanding of the opportunities and risks, I think, is essential. And we haven't even talked about the comprehensive plan. So on that, I'm just going to hold comments to the next opportunity to speak in a public comment, which I will say is woefully inadequate structurally, considering the governance structure and process in our town. We have little to no opportunity for any 
two-way feedback and discussion. And this forum is not adequate for that. Thank you. Other comments? No other? Close public comment. Uh, minutes of July 18, 2018, regular town council meeting. I'll accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Uh, amendments? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. There are no adjustments to the agenda. Items to be signed will be the treasurer's warrants, which I will sign later in the meeting. Uh, item eight on the agenda, non-action items. Presentation on the public safety building. And I would look to the town manager. Yes, uh, Kevin Freeman, chairman of the Ad Hoc Building Committee, is uh, here with us this evening. Good evening. I'm Kevin Freeman. I am the chair of the Ad Hoc Public Safety Building Committee. I live out on uh, Sterlingwood Drive off of Broad Turn Road. Um, we've been together as a committee since early December of uh, 2016, and um, a lot has happened since then, including the successful vote to, um, to make the project a reality. Uh, and since uh, last fall, since Election Day last fall and, and in December, when we um, continued our contract with Context Architecture, um, we uh, brought together the whole project team and right on the heels of it, we started a process to uh, engage a construction manager to join our project team as well as uh, uh, soliciting uh, proposals from uh, owners' representatives to uh, represent the town. Um, so our team came in uh, uh, full complement uh, at the first of the year. Um, in the audience tonight is Tom Perkins from Dirigo Engineering, who has been acting as our full-time owners' representative, um, acting on our behalf, really kind of lessening, taking some of the load off Chief Thurlow and Chief Moulton, who had really been doing the heavy lifting through our first year of the development of the project. Um, we also, uh, through a competitive process, engaged um, a local firm, ultimately, as our construction manager, Landry French Construction, um, on Pleasant Hill Road. And uh, they've been involved with us since uh, early February. Um, we uh, have been moving forward. And uh, I know it's been a while since uh, we've, we've come and had a, had a formal update with you. And I'm uh, here tonight to let you know where we're sitting as of August 15th, 2018. Um, probably the most visible part of the project has, uh, has been that we now um, have signage down in the, old, in the uh, Memorial Park. Um, the site plan... Uh, was revised as part of, uh, we submitted uh, for the uh, Department of Environmental Protection uh, our, for the permits that will be needed. And in the process of that, in, in public hearings and in modifying and trying to better the project, lessen the impact on Memorial Park, um, one of the major moves that, uh, that has happened with the project is that we have... Uh, Move the access road to Sawyer Road closer to the property line. We moved it east, uh, closer to the property line with um, Sudsy Car Wash. And um, we feel that it's uh, lessened the impact on the, uh, on the park. There's still some modification that has to be made to the, to the uh, walkway. Um, but uh, that submission, which is now... Um, in process at DEP is uh, really kind of the, the, uh, the major thing that, is, uh, th that has happened in terms of uh, the site plan and the access road uh, coming out of Sawyer Road. Um, in the park, and, that, and these, uh, 
these renderings that you're seeing are in the town park, right at the area uh, where the entrance will be. Um, this is the perspective uh, looking from Sawyer Road towards, um, you know, kind of looking north and east towards uh, Sudsey on the uh, lower right and the new public safety building on the, uh, on the left. Um, there's been uh, signage put in the park, also um, a flyer with uh, frequently asked questions and information, which is also available on the town website. It was recently in the town newsletter. It's also been featured, I believe, in, in the Scarborough Leader as well. Um, So that is where we're sitting in, in, in terms of, uh, well, let me, let me go to the permitting side of this. Um, we submitted for um, permitting for the project, and right now it's in uh, technical review. It's in process. Um, we are uh, getting status reports. Angela Blanchett from our engineering department has kind of led that effort to stay in touch with with the DEP office in Portland. I can tell you, as you know, a lot of people don't, I think a lot of people think I'm a, an official spokesman for the town of Scarborough at times, but <laughs> uh, I work in the construction industry. I'm the vice president of Martini Northern. We're a construction manager in Portsmouth. And um, we made a decision that we would not pursue this project when I was approached. We, we knew realistically the chances of a New Hampshire company would to build a local project in Scarborough would probably not happen, but um, <clears throat> I can tell you that permits, gaining permits from the DEP's Portland office right now is not a quick process. It's a very, very active construction market. There are a number of projects that are waiting for permits just like us. And, um, you know, the, they're they're doing their due diligence on their side, and we're working through the process. We're hopeful that we would get it uh, in an August time frame. I think more realistically, we realize that it's probably going to be the latter part of September. Um, but uh, uh, that's where we're sitting in that. Um, we have moved forward, though, with a, um, with a bid process. And uh, we, we released early packages for um, concrete, steel, and site. And we did that uh, in anticipation that we would get an early uh, approval for the permits. Um, we have uh, selected, Landry French has gone through the whole process with Tom Perkins and made recommendations for um, firms to hire. We got multiple bids in every category on uh, the early work packages. And um, right now we have uh, uh, letters of uh, intent to um, N.S. Giles of Bangor for the concrete foundations. They've been doing a lot of work here in the area. Um, the um, site is uh, the Selected uh, contractor is R.J. Grondon from Gorham, who has done a lot of work here historically. And the uh, structural steel, we uh, are very pleased to let you know that it's James McBrady on Pleasant Hill Road. And um, we've had quite a few local contractors that have uh, bid the work. Uh, not only the early work packages that are, that you know, commitments have been made to these to these subcontractors, but uh, we're also in a in a bid process for the balance of the project, and those bids um, came in last week, got very good coverage, very good coverage um, across all trades, um, and uh, right now, Landry French is in a post bid review and analysis. Um, just to let you know, no surprise, the early, the early returns are we're over budget. And this is exactly why we've gone construction management with our approach to this project. Because as in the case with the, with the early bid packages, they come in, Landry French, along with Tom Perkins, 
goes through and does this complete analysis to make sure that they've got all their scope items, uh, all their, uh, you know, making sure we're having an apples to apples comparison between the, the bidders. And um, in the case of uh, our concrete and our steel numbers, it was clear through the post bid review that we were better going with NS Giles and with McBrady than we were other, other firms that had bid. Um, on the um, bids that came in last week, that process is taking place right now where the, uh, they're reviewing and speaking with the two low bid contractors in each one of the trades. Um, generally, the architectural trades have come in on budget. Where we're a little over uh, is in the uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire. So Landry French, uh, along with Tom Perkins, are meeting with the two low bidding contractors in each one of those trades and going through. And that process, we expect the analysis process, uh, process will probably conclude sometime next week. We're, we're saying the 24th. Um, and uh, moving forward, there's, uh, once a low bidder has been uh, selected, um, Landry French will continue to work with that selected subcontractor to, again, uh, improve the value and pricing of the project. So we, we fully expect that uh, uh, we will get to the budget. And we think that, uh, in fact, we may be getting a little favor in the, in the fact that the permitting process is not coming right upon us. So it'll give the time for the project team. And I, and I guess, you know, I've been saying just Tom and Landry French, but our design team is absolutely involved in this process uh, right through the uh, right through uh, from beginning to end, and uh, the term that is being used for this step two process is one that that we use in the construction <coughs> industry is its design assist. And what design assist does is it does not touch the design intent of the designer, the intent of the project, the go the program goals are not compromised at all. Um, but there's an assist in, in determining more cost-effective means and methods, materials, specifications. You know, uh, the uh, architect could say, well, you know, use such and such for, your, um, for, for a particular system where, or the equivalent, or the equivalent, and the equivalent is part of that design, design assist process. As you look to see if you can find a, a more cost effective, better value way to deliver the same design, um, same design performance. So, so anyway, that, uh, that process there, we're expecting that that could take another two to three weeks. So it's gonna push us where we probably will come to a final um, GMP sometime in the month of September, I think is realistic. Time takes time. And, um, and you know, one, one thing that uh, we have been going up against somewhat is, uh, is the fact that, you know, you just look at the number of hotels that are under construction in, in Portland right now and the number of hotels that are being considered and getting someone's attention has, you know, we've done a good job of that. We've had a lot of local involvement, um, but you know people are busy, so we um, we want to take the time so we can have a uh, a nice thorough job of this post review post bid review period, and uh, we're very confident we're going to get there. We uh, we expect to be at our budget ultimately. Um, so I think I've, oh, and then uh, the other thing that I wanted to cover too is um, the uh, scenarios that, that, I've, that I've laid out in our way of getting there. And in terms of, uh, in particular, the, the DEP permit, 
Um, we're still holding to a 15-month project once we start. And we are expecting to, uh, to start by October 1. Uh, we would be great if we could start before then, but I think realistically just um, given, given what we're seeing coming out of uh, other projects that are in review at DEP that everything is just going slower. There was clearly a bottleneck uh, earlier this summer um, and uh, I, I just, just to throw out anecdotally, uh, the uh, Center for Wildlife in York, which is a sizable nonprofit project, they're waiting on their permit. And, and you know, there's, in their, they have to go through the Portland office. And uh, you know, there's, I think you will see that there's a reason why a number of jobs haven't moved forward is a combination of waiting for their permitting and then also going through the same exact thing that we're going through is that you really got to you really got to roll up your sleeves and and uh, you know work with a selected contractor to to get the thing within budget. So um, you know we wish we wish we were in a, a better place, but reality is we're right where we're supposed to be, <laughs> and um, uh, we have a very good team in place. Uh, they've been working. Uh, Incredibly hard. I think uh, we would all agree that um, that it's three different team, you know, three different organizations, being the, the town of Scarborough, the context architecture design team, and now the Landry French uh, construction team. And 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 we really are a team. Everyone's been working very well together, and and uh, keeping in account the the fact that this is a publicly funded project, and that. You know, we, we're, as we said last year, we're, we're, pick, we're picking function over, over form. Uh, we want a functional, very uh, durable, low maintenance, low cost operate, operating cost facility. So um, that's, that's where we're at. And I, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Kevin. Questions for Kevin? Chris? Um, just a, a couple quick ones. Did, uh, you said working with the constructors, you don't see any potential challenges with the delays in scheduling of labor availability or anything like that due to the, the bump out? Meaning, are they taking other projects and now we're, we're going to slip our schedule even further because there's too much work out there kind of thing? Well, I, I, think, I think that's some of it. Okay. Um, that, that is clearly affecting, there's, there's really two big drivers that are affecting the, the prices right now, um, the tariffs. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. clearly, I mean, we, I mean, literally, we go from tweet to tweet. Um, steel prices, uh, recently, with the especially with the Canadian, uh, the tariff on the Canadians, the prices went up to get steel from Canada. Mm -hmm. The response of domestic producers raised the price to equal what the cost is coming from Canada, right. and there's less capacity in the United States, so. Every construction project is, is realizing that um, there are substantial increases in anything related to steel. Um, the second part of that is, um, is the manpower. Manpower is an issue. It's, it's, it's an issue on a public project in Albany, New York. It's an, it's an issue on a project in Presque Isle, Maine, right? And, uh, it, and it's, it is certainly an issue in, uh, in Portland, Maine, right now. Um, there are, you know, the Maine Med job is, is in full swing. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and what contractors will do is uh, protect themselves by saying, well, if we're going to take on that job, we're going to make some money at it. And so there really wasn't a, a, a tremendous uh, difference in the prices that we got and we were getting like four to five prices in some of these bigger trades because this is a big project. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not really getting a great spread in uh, one to five. Um, but, but yeah, that, that whole idea of, of uh, available manpower, it, it's an issue, especially for, the, for the, uh, the, the more complex trades like mechanical, electrical, plumbing. Other questions? Can I follow up? Chris. Yeah, so do you, do you see that impacting the October, your anticipated October breaking ground, or right now you no. think we're okay? Okay. Yeah. No. All right. Um, and then the last question, I'd be a little concerned about materials, because I know that's usually a, a, a big target area to say, just like, I know 
when we built, we looked at the initial costs. Um, we went with some some pretty high grade materials because of the longevity of the building and the fact that it is a you know it, it probably I'm assuming is going to double as a public shelter or, or you know civic shelter or something like that for the community. I would just want to make sure that we that we keep an eye on not stepping over a dollar to pick up a dime and save money on the front end, but now we've got to do renovations and rebuilds for wow. 10 years down the road. To, to that point, um, our original estimates uh, included escalators. Okay. And, uh, and uh, Tom Perkins has, has used the, escala you know, the escalators and contingency very okay. wisely throughout. So we actually, in the end, um, Though the steel came in a little higher than we wanted, uh, the negotiated price we had savings. We had savings in other areas. Gotcha. Um, and overall, the architectural numbers, um, and that's re that's really your, you know, your brick and your and your um, drywall and, and all of that. Those appear to be coming in where they were expected. The the overage has been on those on the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and. Okay. and you know, that's, that's where the real effort is being concentrated. Other questions? Thank you, Kevin. That was a terrific thank update, you. and thank you for your service on this project. Well, you're very welcome, and I've got some, uh, some great people that are on the committee with me, and I, I can't emphasize enough um, how uh, we, we really made a, uh, the right decision to go construction management because it, we're all on the same side of the table. Everything is identified, and uh, thank you, and I look forward to, to uh, joining you all when we uh, break ground uh, later this year. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Second non-action item on the agenda, presentation of the proposed financial and fiscal policy. I'll ask the town manager and the chair of the finance committee to address this. Okay. It's, it's probably mis uh, mislabeled here. It's not really a presentation. It's really an introduction. Um, I think correctly, the chairman thought that this was a fairly complicated policy, just given its length and uh, some of the revisions. And so it made sense that we perhaps take this a little slower. And so we introduce it tonight. And then given your level of comfort, we'll bring it back for consideration at your next meeting. Um, I get the other factor involved there is that this is not time critical. In fact, on that point, this matter has been kicked around the Finance Committee for a year plus, a year plus, <laughs> really in earnest on probably every agenda. but. Even before that, some of the concepts, the, the financial health metrics, had been conversation points for three, four, or five years. So uh, this is the culmination of a lot of work. Uh, and essentially, in essence, uh, it rolls up into one policy, four existing policies. That's debt management, investment, fund balance, and capital planning. And not surprisingly, each of those, they're all interrelated, and there's some overlap. And so it, it does make uh, a lot of sense to integrate them all into one policy so it flows and they complement each other. Um, as I alluded to, we've also, as part of this, adopted uh, five different metrics. These are intended to be um, financial health metrics, kind of take the pulse, if you will. With each of these, and I'll, I'll list them, uh, there's a policy statement that provides some further guidance as to, um, um, I guess, watch areas. If we get to certain areas, uh, it really is a prompt probably for the Finance Committee to dig a little deeper and understand that and maybe do something corrective. Uh, those metrics involve annual debt as a percentage of uh, operating revenues, debt as a percentage of state equalized value, debt per capita, uh, per capita debt as a percentage of per capita income, and unrestricted fund balance as a percentage of revenues. We spent a lot of time understanding which of the, those metrics out there really make sense, and, and debt is certainly a, uh, a major theme here um, and an area that uh, we really want to watch carefully going forward. We do expect to develop a, a dashboard, kind of a simplified version of this, um, and staff will be reporting to the Finance Committee annually on these. Um, we'll probably arrange to do it sometime early in each year. Um, and uh, I think the, the Finance Committee is entirely capable of um, understanding those things and, and reporting back to Council should some corrective action be, be necessary in the future. So with that, I... 
No, I think that sums it up perfectly. I, I just want to kind of do a shout out to Larissa Crock Basis in town. Yes. She, she spent a ton of time doing this and pulling it together and did a great job and spent a lot of time educating on us about the different metrics we can use. And actually, she has developed that dashboard that Tom has, Tom, Tom has referenced. So this is here for your consideration. We'll bring it back. But it's a lot of material to get through. So for those in the audience, um, we would I'd love to have your, your input or feedback but uh, for town council members to, to look at it and send questions our way and we'll try to address it. Maybe we, you prefer. We, Sorry. Yeah, we, we deferred uh, putting this on for action tonight because it is complicated. Uh, and uh, I you know, solicited input from the Finance Committee uh, to see if they thought that going slow, allowing the public to uh, hear comments tonight uh, we've posted as a part of the agenda package uh, the entirety of it uh, and we'll take it up at the next meeting again for adoption but uh, it was not urgent but it's uh, uh, a lot of work has gone into it from the Finance Committee uh, okay. and, it, and it's very significant in terms of us being able to <clears throat> take care to uh, adopt good financial practices and good budgets. Yeah, Chris. I Call out. No, call no, go ahead. I was going to say, I also want to thank Councilor Chiazzo and Councilor Bayline for all the effort put forth into it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Many years. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, I, I just wanted to elaborate, too, for the Council's sake and, and the public's sake. It wasn't just uh, <coughs> the three Finance Committee members and staff. We had Bond Council review it. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of input from, from quote unquote, uh, industry professionals across the board to, to help us. Um, review it, make suggestions and changes, so it, it's not just a uh, organic process internally. We had a lot of expert involvement as well, so it's it's not just our ideas. They're kind of embedded through uh, through some expertise as well, so that's a great point. So, uh, public comment on this uh, item on the agenda. Anyone wishing to comment, please approach the podium. Good evening, Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Just, I haven't had a chance to read through it, but I see a lot of different percentages on, on various types of debt. What I didn't see, and I know in the previous policy, we didn't have a hard number, a hard ceiling saying, okay, our overall debt, no matter which category, what percentage of this one or that one, uh, we'll keep debt at X hundreds of millions of dollars, 200 million or whatever. That I didn't see that number. Wondered if it might be reasonable to consider it. Thank you. Would you like to respond to that, Peter? Yeah, um, Larry, I think I think it is in there, and I, you and I can go over it. I'll, I'll show you. I, we, we did try to get to a hard number that, that would do that, but if it's not there, but I'd be glad to talk it over with you. I think it's in there. Other public comment? So now we'll close the matter. No action to be taken on that. Uh, order 18-52. Oh, is, is there an opportunity for questions? No. <laughs> well, of course not. Uh, yes. Uh, please uh, recognize Councilor Roll. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I just had a couple questions about the um, the ratios. Um, do did we have some kind of benchmark or, or that we had set set these two when we, when we put them in in place? I'm just curious what what it is that we we use from a, to know that that ratio of, for instance. Uh, per capita debt as a percentage of capital income was good or bad? Just curious. And, yes, I mean, Larissa had a bunch of sort of benchmarks she shared with us. We had several different sources that we used, and we kind of vectored the ones that seemed to make the best fit, and we certainly can share those those resources. But, yeah, there was some method to the to the madness, if you will, on, on how we got there. Gotcha. The overriding theme that went through that, I believe, is uh, really focusing on those things that the on um, oh, rating agencies yeah. feel are most important. Yeah. We really try to dial in around those and better understand those with the hope that it's going to help uh, keep our bond rating high. Gotcha. Councilor Bebe. I already took care of it. Sorry. Uh, Councilor Rowan. The other question that I had when I was looking at the, um, the ratios was we have a policy statement around uh, per capita debt as a percentage of per capita income. But the policy statement of the uh, debt per capita, which is um, related, was kind of re restated in terms of the um, percentage of uh, the, the debt per capita. Um, uh, 
Oh, I see. Of, 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 a, of a base year. Is, is that what you're referring to as your hard cap? I mean, I, I guess I didn't, I didn't catch the hard cap in there, but the, uh, the debt per capita, what I'm confused about is that it, it mentions the, the per capita income um, ratio again in the policy statement. Um, I, I can try and tackle that yeah, one if you yeah, want. Yeah. I, I think what you're saying is, and this is what one of the things we struggle with in finance, was that when you do a, a, a debt per capita, you base it on the consensus uh, the, the census numbers, I mean, if you say so, it's great the year after the census, but it, it has a diminishing value over time. So while most of the people out there want to see the debt per capita rating uh, and the value that valuation, it gets skewed as we go out. So we put that, we try to give a kind of a description in there of saying, we're going to use that, but we're also going to take other methods to do snapshots to make sure that one variable doesn't out skew the other. So we get a kind of a bigger picture, but we take that into account because that's what a lot of other financial measurement tools are looking at, um, but we're also looking at other mechanisms to kind of balance that. So our debt per capita, and that's our debt per capita will probably skew over time because our census won't change, but our valuation or our tax rate will change. So that number will be an artificial number, so to speak. Does, does, that, make, does that answer your question where you're coming at? Or? I, I think so. So, okay. so basically, we, we put all these things in there because we wanted to look at a, at a bunch of different things. Because right. another Correct. concern yeah. with per capita would be, would be that you know, the, the mixture of our residential to, uh, you know, other, other terms of valuation, which is what pays the, the debt service. Right. Uh, but I, I see it's just, a, it's just a tool that we have in, in the tool bag to, as a guide. Yeah, and, and I think, again, if I could just, the, the follow is, you know, we weren't looking at this as necessarily hard stops by saying, when we hit this number, you know, we have to take, you know, massive action financial. It was, it was uh, the, the idea of the, of, the, of, the, of, of the dashboard is, you know, uh, green light, yellow light, red light. So once we get a yellow light, that says, okay, this is a warning area. We need to get with staff. We need to get with bond rating agencies or, or whoever we need to discuss to say, okay, where are we really at? This is an area we need to look at as a policy issue. Uh, do we need to adjust policies? How are we going to address this? It's kind of give us an early warning system, if you will, as opposed to having to react to, yep. you know, something that comes down the pipe and all of a sudden our bond rating changes and we, now we have to respond and react to it. Gotcha. One side. If I could just, I, the, my last concern with the uh, debt per capita is it looks like it's the only one that's not um, necessarily in, inflation proof, but now that I'm looking at it, it says adjusted for inflation, so I, I retract. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Comments? Seeing none? Thank you. Uh, order 1852, 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the request from the Board of Education to place on the November 6, 2018 municipal ballot referendum language to create the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, uh, GSEA. Ballot question is as follows. Do you favor the formation of a regional service center pursuant to an interlocal agreement for the Greater Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center as approved by the governing bodies of the parties thereto and the commissioner, commissioner of the Department of Education. And I would ask uh, this matter be introduced by our superintendent, Julie Kuckenberg. Good evening. Um, here tonight to seek um, your approval for the school system to become a partner in the, re in the regional service center. And so I believe with each of you has been shared a memo that sort of outlines the benefits and the context um, and the work that we're doing. I think we've had anywhere from 15 to 20 meetings together as we developed this interlocal agreement and to talk about sort of what could be the benefits of us regionalizing some services um, with the intent behind it to be that we're looking to improve educational services and programs um, and reduce our costs or share our costs. And this is something that the Scarborough Public Schools already does and has done for a number of years in a variety of ways. Um, what makes it very different at this point in time is that uh, whether or not we're a part of a regional service center is now directly connected to our funding. And so um, there is a phase in model for this, but if you recall the conversations around system administration, um, it's now dependent upon the amount of money you'll receive per pupil for your system administration is now dependent upon whether or not you're a part of a regional service center. Um, and so this year being a part of that brings us um, some additional funding 
to the uh, to the district in terms. It's about forty thousand dollars, I believe. Um, and then next year, the per people amount almost doubles. It actually more than doubles. Uh, so we could be looking at anywhere over eighty thousand dollars in additional funding that would come to the district. This is important for all districts. It's important for us um, as minimum receivers because this happens outside of or as a, an addition to our allocated amount of subsidy. And so some of the things that we're looking to share services in are professional development um, and food service purchasing. And you'll see that in the interlocal agreement um, and in the memo I provided, it also lists some other areas that would be available to us. But for Scarborough particularly, we have to choose two in order to be a part of the regional service center. And those would be the two areas that we're looking at. We're already um, members to a food co-op, and we've been members for a number of years, which allows us to have better purchasing power and things like that. So we would just be expanding on those services. And some other benefits of being a part of this Greater Sebago Education Alliance is allowing us to access some grant fundings. So we already, um, as a as the Sebago Education Alliance, applied for one FEDIS grant, and the FEDIS grants are the funds for efficient delivery of educational services. We did not, we weren't awarded that grant, um, but we're currently looking at applying for a second FEDIS grant in this next round, which is due in November, looking at school safety. And so again, it allows you know, all of the superintendents in the area to come together and look at what are some of the things we're trying to do to improve educational outcomes and how can we find more efficient ways to do that. Applying for the grants can be cumbersome, but when we're doing it all together and we're each taking pieces, we have seen that to be a benefit for us to meet the quick turnarounds and deadlines for some of these, um, for the FEDIS grant specifically. So I don't know how much detail you want me to go into. Um, the reason that this goes on the ballot is because it has a direct impact on our funding, and so we need to ask our voters to approve that. Uh, I believe two districts already put it on their June ballot, and the rest of us, it will be on the November ballot. I, I th the fact that it has to be approved by referendum, I think uh, allow, and our responsibility tonight is to authorize it to go on the ballot. Yep. Uh, but this, uh, and while that may seem like a limited role, this does provide a good opportunity for the public to understand this is really the beginning. The public hasn't really been exposed to this, but they're going to be voting on it November 11th and November 6th. So I think we'll probably have some questions uh, so that people will better understand. And I'm going to ask before public comment uh, whether town council members have questions that they'd like to ask you so as to more clearly inform the public. Sure. So anyone here? Uh, well, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that the benefit was roughly $40,000. Was there a cost to, to participating? It, it looked like they had a budget that that, uh, presumably that money has to come from somewhere. So we have put in um, a budget into the interlocal agreement. It's the, the draft budget. And what we're paying is a $1,000 membership fee to be a part of the Gr Greater Sebago Education Alliance. And that also allows us, w becoming a regional service center, allows us to get some direct funding from the state to pay for the executive director role that you saw outlined in the interlocal agreement as well. Got it. So, so the state pays for the, state funding pays for the, uh, alliance itself and right as a benefit to us for being a member yep and then we will purchase other services so if there's some professional development events that we want to be a part of we may you know purchase buy into certain <coughs> aspects of the agreement gotcha. Thank you. yep other questions so That's just a follow-up um and i and i only went through it pretty briefly um, there's also an allocation fee, so I'm assuming that if there is a budget shortfall from the state, then whatever is remaining would then be allocated out and distributed amongst all of the partners or the, the, the members? That's my understanding of how it will work. Um, but if, I mean, if you want, if you have specific questions that I might not be able to answer tonight, I can No, I just, I mean, because the, uh, the reason why I'm asking is the reliability of the state funding something um, is not necessarily comforting. So th there's a potential in which there's actually added increases or uh, additional expenses that may be unexpected, maybe not in the first year because this is just a wonderful idea, but it could be in a couple of years. So I think that's a... The other question I had is, um, um, have we ever... Uh, I know we did one with a food up. Uh, I believe there was one that we exited 
because I was looking at some of the terms mm -hmm. as far as um, how if we decide that we don't want it because it does become too expensive because of the allocation cost. Um, it seems that the clause on how to get out of it's pretty tight and that you can't. Um, can, you, can we exit from this at any time that the governing body says so, meaning the school board says we don't longer? Yep, there's you? certain timelines to which we have to make that decision by, and that's outlined in the interlocal agreement. But one of the things that all of the superintendents were concerned about is we want to be able to do this so long as it makes sense and it actually is providing better services to our kids and saving our communities money. Um, so that was something we worked really closely with attorneys on to make sure that there was, you know, a divorce clause, if you will, so that we could get out of it get out of the service center if we felt we needed to for any reason. Okay, thanks. Councilor Gazem. So full disclosure, I unfortunately, uh, Superintendent Kuckerberger and I were playing tag yesterday. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a lot of questions. Okay. Um, I have to be very careful because I don't want to get into the weeds of why you're doing what you're doing because we don't have control over that. Mm -hmm. But in reference to Councilor Baybine's uh, comment, I, I was on the Board of Education when we exited the Sebago Alliance in 2015. Um, and that was, um, there were some circumstances around that exit that I'm concerned that we don't repeat. Um, not so much from the, uh, the impact on the educational piece, but there were some financial implications that we were kind of left stuck with in, the, in, in our budget. So uh, the devil's always in the details, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that legals had a chance to review this. But I, I did have some, some, some key questions, and I'm, I'm happy to go over those now. Um, and I guess if they're, uh, if they're outstanding, um, then we, we can address that, I guess, at the end. Um, I noticed it says for new members, um, the Board of Directors may, con may condition membership by imposing additional obligations. Is this agreement that we have in front of us Scarborough's obligation, or is this just a general blanket agreement that's going to be approved? Or do we have a separate individual agreement for Scarborough? This is our joint agreement. That new member clause in the interlocal agreement is if other districts decide they want to join the Greater Sebago Education Alliance. So that's after the foundation of the initial group. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, the discontinuance, I, I kind of agree with Councillor Babon. I thought that was a little bit restrictive. Uh, I know it was, uh, uh, you have to de declare by, I think it's November 1st. Uh, of the previous year, and and also there was a, a reference to an MSCA, uh, a state law. It says, uh, any member may withdraw from the GSA effective at the end of a fiscal year, provided that the withdrawing member satisfies applicable state law. Can you elaborate on what that state law is? Uh, so that I, it sounds like it's 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 a pretty tough clause to to follow through with. So basically what will happen is um, the, the Department of Education is calling them incentives for mm -hmm. being a part of a regional service center. If we are not um, utilizing a minimum of two services from two different categories, and there's four categories, then we would, be, we would not be a, a, abiding by that law. And so in, in terms of us exiting the um, agreement, we would have to ensure that we're following the law and knowing that it's going to directly affect our system admin funding if we chose to do that. All right, so, there, so that would be more of an impact directly on us, not a prerequisite for exiting the agreement. Right, and okay. so I think if I'm um, hearing one of your questions about what did it cost us to dissolve the former agreement that we had, and that was really around the formation of a, a special education mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. where we tuition students to as a region. Um, that was a function of the, uh, um, the Sebago Education Alliance, and what, um, Really, the challenges came with that, from my understanding, um, around uh, the way that we were getting reimbursed from the state and having to have one unit be the fiscal agent for that school. For that school, we were saving anywhere from fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars a year on tuition per student when we were a part of that. But we did have to pay um, like a separation fee when we when that was dismantled and it was two thousand eight hundred dollars and thirty six cents that was just divided by the five different school districts that were a part of that in yeah. this case we're not creating any sort of institution we're looking more at programming so we're talking about professional development for instructional coaches we're talking about developing a leadership academy so that we can build a school leadership pipeline to get um, more principals in the pipeline and also looking at um, t 
together we're looking at like ELL, English language learner intake processes, which isn't something that is a um, massive need for us right now, but we do have a small number of ELL families, and so how we bring them into the district is something that we're interested in as well. Mm -hmm. So on these on the, the functions, programming, and services, there were A through F functions. Uh, are those on a uh, like an a la carte basis? You pay for each one individually. So we can choose to participate in each one individually, and mm -hmm. so some of those things we won't right now. So we also then have subcommittees and different superintendents and or designees are a part of those subcommittees in developing those programmings. Um, but we will not be choosing all of those services at this time. Um, yeah, and it was a little, I mean, I guess one of my other concerns too was um, almost the, I guess, the inability to control the budget to some extent. Um, I know when we deal with uh, the regional, any kind of regional coalition like a vocational or something, and oftentimes the budget is presented as an overall budget and it's divided amongst the groups. Um, so would our budget, our, our obligation to fund that um, be predicated on just what we utilize or would it be predicated on the total budget divided by the number of districts if there's, if there's a shortfall, let's say, in, in state funding? So um, a couple of things. One, the, every member of the superintendent is a part of the executive board, and every vote has equal weight. So even mm -hmm. though we're bringing Portland, a, lot, a much larger school district, mm -hmm. into um, this greater Sebago Education Alliance, we each have an equal vote. And so the budget is collaboratively, collaboratively developed and then voted on in that way. And again, we, are, we do pay the $1,000 membership fee, but then you're paying for the services that you're utilizing as you go. Yeah, I'm not worried. I'm more worried about if, as infrastructure grows on this, um, mm -hmm. if there is a, a need for a facility. I mean, one of the issues I found in here that was challenging to me was the executive director under the direction of the board of directors is authorized to invest GSA funds on behalf of GSA in accordance with this main law, as well as they're able to bond uh, uh, based on approval of the superintendents. But even if we disagree, we're then liable for that debt incursion as well while we're a member, correct? Um, uh at this time, we have no intention of doing that, but moving forward, that could be that could be the case. Okay. Right now, we're not looking at facilities in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Um. And what the the law is saying there, we're required to have an executive director. It can be one of the members of the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, or we can hire. Um, an external person to do that. And right now we've chosen to post that as an external position in the anticipation of. of yeah, the and then I guess, so I mean the funding is going to be what it's going to be. We can't predict that. I, I understand that fully based on state. My last, I guess, biggest concern was more on the issue of liability for the town, um, mm -hmm. particularly on two clauses. Uh, the insurance one, it says each member, associate member, and non member service re recipient shall be responsible for obtaining and maintaining insurance adequate to protect itself from risks, if any, related to this agreement. That's number one. But then there's a no exclusivity clause that basically says the, the GSEA uh, is, is not, uh, no, sorry, that was, that was separate for not, doesn't require us to go outside of an agreement. Um, but does this no hold harmless clause, does that mean we are obligated if something goes wrong with this service agreement? and we're a member, we're responsible for the outcome of that? Of Meaning, let's say there's a, a, a claim or something. So, so the last, with the last group, the, the Sebago Alliance, one of the reasons the challenges was meeting state requirements for IPAs. Um, and uh, not IPAs. IEPs. Uh, IEPs. Yeah, right. Um, we, they were unable to do that, but we still had an obligation as a town to fulfill that obligation. Right. So. I'm wondering in here with this language is if are we still on the hook, and it sounds like we are, for all of our obligations, even if this agreement or this organization doesn't fulfill theirs, we're still on the hook for all that. Is that fair? In, in terms of meeting the state law, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you for taking the time to evaluate that. This is uh, new to the community, and it has to be mm -hmm. voted on, and therefore, this kind of uh, question and answer is very helpful. Any other questions? Uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to address this matter, please approach the podium. Close the public comment. Uh, accept the motion. Uh, 
Second. Second. Uh, Peter. Uh, discussion. This is a motion to put the matter on the agenda, on the, on the ballot for November 6th. Uh, Chris. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think on the surface, it's a, it's a great, it's an idea, it's a great idea, it's a good opportunity. I think there's gonna need to be a little bit more public uh, education on really the kind of details of, of what's going into it and what our obligations are because it's, it is very complex and complicated. I know it's agreement amongst nine or 10 districts, um, but uh, the, 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 the community really needs to have an understanding of what our costs are gonna be, what our savings are gonna be, and then what our liability ultimately is gonna be and the potential risk of getting involved in a group like that. Um, so I, I'm certainly gonna support it. I think it, I'm, I'm glad that it's a vote that has to go to the community. Uh, I just hope the community is, is a good campaign to educate the community and get all their questions and issues resolved so that we know what we're voting on and what the impact would be if we don't pass it and what the impact would be if it does pass. So. Other, other comments? Council Baby. Sorry. No. Council Rowan was first. Council Rowan. Thank you. My apologies. No. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't hear it mentioned uh, this evening, but I did see in a, in a memorandum, and I think it's important to, um, to point out that this was unanimously uh, recommended by the school board that we put this on the ballot. Um, and so I'm intending mm -hmm. to, to support it tonight. Good. Thank you. Councilor Bayby? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, um, yeah. something about interlocal agreements that depend upon state funding particularly around education and a way that they have treated education, particularly the last eight years, is extremely um, uncomfortable uh, because I think that it will draw greater burden upon the community. But um, at the same time, I also trust our school board and school department in making the best decisions on behalf of uh, the district and hope that uh, while they've given its due diligence in approving it, that they will also give the due diligence should we have to ex exit that um, if the citizens approve it. And the fact is that the citizens, I always believe that no matter what I believe, if we send it to the citizens to vote, um, that's always a better solution than uh, just seven of us deciding on something so critical. So um, I'm going to put my personal kind of opinion aside around state reliance on educational funding and um, we'll support this. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you look at what this is, it's a collaboration agreement. It's an effort by uh, the communities in this region to be able to pool resources in a way that gets uh, the value from uh, larger bargaining. And this is pretty common. It's, uh, in, con in concept, very good. Uh, what we have benefited from is uh, people looking at the details and what the implications are, what the risks are. And I think that's important so that uh, we're not blindsided, and I appreciate uh, the superintendent uh, spending the time to explain to us what the risks are and, and what, the, uh, what the extent is. So, further comments? Uh, Katie. Um, I was just gonna, I, having worked in the world of education and seen a lot of different uh, partnerships like this, um, I, I know that the intent is very good. <laughs> Uh, I do think Chris uh, Chiazzo is correct, the devil's in the details, and um, there are a few things in here that are a little bit concerning, but I think ongoing education for all of us and the public is going to be um, the key, and really I'm, I'm comfortable putting it to voters to let them decide. Good. Thank you. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Kugenberger. Order 18-53, 7 p.m. in public hearing action on the new request for a new junkyard permit from SVR New England, LPDBA Scarborough Recycling, located at 40 Homes Road. Uh, new owner, formerly the Scarborough Auto Parts, and I asked the town clerk to address this. The applicant is actually present this evening if there are any questions. Um, this is a change of ownership, as noted. Um, that He's been working on it for, I think, three or four months, two months. Um, he's been working with uh, codes downstairs with Brian Longstaff and the state, and everything is in order. Recommended. Everything in order. Uh, and I certainly would appreciate you introducing yourself. If you want to step up to the podium, we'd enjoy meeting you. Good evening. Uh, my name's Dan Dickinson. I'm 
John Dickinson's son, who's the still current owner. Um, I'm in the process of purchasing the facility. And um, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I've been, when I say two months, it's been two years I've been working on a process to take over the facility. Uh, I'm the third generation. My grandfather started this in 1964. Uh, and it's my intent to continue recycling cars, re uh, recycling cars um, and selling used auto parts. Uh, I see that the volume of cars mm -hmm. going to their end of life is increasing, and uh, this facility is going to be a, an important part of that in this area. We buy a lot of cars, um, and um, there, there's a lot of recyclable value in, in the car, and I'm trying to set up a, a new and more informed way of doing the recycling that's cleaner and uh, getting more value out of the vehicles. Um, done a lot of homework of what they do in Europe, and uh, in Europe they don't let anything get, go to the landfill, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on is 100% recycling <coughs> instead of 70% recycling. <laughs> Great. I think uh, everyone appreciates seeing a family business continued and uh, handed down. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to uh, address this matter, please approach the podium. Accept the motion. So, so moved. Second. Uh, comment? Chris. Uh, just a question, if I could, uh, to the uh, town clerk. Um, this. This is just a transfer of ownership. It's not like we're creating an additional. Correct. It's just okay. a transfer of ownership. Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I, what I didn't know, uh, mention, I, notices were sent out to all the abutters, which is a requirement. We never heard anything back. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Uh, order 1854, a 7 p.m. public hearing in action on the new request for an innkeeper's license and a food handler's license for Jerry Portland Mall, Inc., DBA Fairfield Inn, Portland, located at 2 Cummings Road. Uh, new owner, formerly Portland Ventures, LLC, and I ask the town clerk to address this matter. Uh, again, the business has been uh, transferred to this new owner, and there's a requirement of the uh, ordinance that we have in place that these uh, licenses be approved. And have a public hearing, and everything's in order uh, with the, our office as well as the code's office. Good. Public hearing uh, is open. Anyone wishing to address this matter, please approach the podium. Close the public hearing and accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Comment? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, old business, order 1841, second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 601, the traffic ordinance, section 25A, <coughs> to eliminate year-round parking along a portion of the Black Point Road. Uh, ordinance uh, committee chairman, uh, Councilor Katarina, is absent today. I sit on the ordinance committee, I think. Uh, I'll introduce the matter. Uh, this is... Uh, along Black Point Road at the uh, Scarborough Beach State Park entrance. Uh, and uh, what the police department has proposed is that a 50-foot setback from the uh, points of the entrance be established a no-parking setback, which would be about oh, two and a half cars, I guess, is what, 50 feet on each side. So it's about five cars uh, would be eliminated from that parking along Black Point Road. And it's really <clears throat> primarily intended to improve the visibility of entering and exiting uh, that space. Uh, so it does not have uh, any substantial impact uh, on the street parking uh, that is allowed. It's about five spaces. Uh, this is second reading, so public comment. None. Uh, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Chris. I, I'll just say, I, I mean, I, we, I think we heard the concerns about limiting public access to the beach and things like that. I think in, in this instance, I don't, I, don't, I don't quite see that as being a, a challenge. We're not restricting anything. It's more of a safety concern. And there's still parking available uh, in other areas, for sure. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't have concerns personally about, you know, the limiting access to the beach. Um, we're not changing requirements or fees or anything like that uh, based on the fact that it's public safety and the 
manager of the state park that's asking for this, I think it's 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 fair and uh, we should probably move it forward. Okay. Other comments, Peter. Yeah, I guess I guess I will be supporting this tonight from from a couple different perspectives. One. I heard from several people that were opposed to it. I know it got put on the table because we did get some emails for folks requesting it, but those emails weren't shared, so I haven't seen those. So I haven't, I haven't been aware of anybody requesting. I did ask for the police report if there's been any incidents or complaints down there, and the answers were no. So I, I am sensitive to, especially where we are around the beach and beach access and perceptions that I think. I, you know, I've been down there, I go down there every weekend, I have never noticed it being a safety issue, so I, I think, I just don't think we, we need another ordinance or another restriction, so I'm not going to support it. Other comments? Katie? Um, yeah, I'm, I would echo uh, what Councilor Hayes shared, and what, one of the things that struck me after the last meeting um, was a comment by uh, some of Butters, who said at the outset, the most number of cars they saw were 10 to 12 cars. And if we're talking about five cars, eliminating five cars, now we're talking about, it might not seem like a big deal, but, but it's, uh, that's almost half of, of what the capacity there is. So um, two and a half cars on either side, I think is what he said. Right? Is that what you said, two and a half cars correct. on either side? And, and it's yeah. not, so I was just adding the two it is an eliminating park, the, the overall parking spaces is unlimited because you can park as far as you want Right. along the roadway, Understood. what you're saying is the point of access uh, to walk down to the beach would be more at an angle. Yeah. So you might walk another 20 feet, <clears throat> which yeah. is why I characterized it as de minimis. At, at any rate, um, mm -hmm. so that's just kind of my thinking on that. It just, uh, I don't see it as a huge issue and a problem down there. Um, and in the winter time, that extra 20 feet does matter. So I'm not going to support this. Councilor Rowe. Yeah, I think, um, so we've been going down to uh, Fair Beach quite a bit this summer, and I've, I've been paying attention to uh, the section of, of roadway there. And it really, it, it really comes around a curve as you're coming, uh, as, as you're coming from Black Point um, back into town. From Prout's Neck. From Prout's Neck, thank you. And uh, uh, I really think that, that um, that I, I can see why that would be an imposition to the, the sight line for visibility. Um, and I, I just don't think it's a, given that, you know, you have miles of roadway there in which, in which to park and we're only asking, you know, 50 feet in each, 50 feet? 50 feet total um, to, be, um, uh, to be restricted. I, I just don't see it as, as an issue, but I appreciate the, the, um, the comments that were made. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. New business. Uh, first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance Section 6, definitions of affordable housing. And the town manager and the liaison representative to the Housing Alliance Committee can address this in introduction. Great. Well, so um, the Council or the uh, Scarborough Housing Alliance over the past several months has been approached by um, a couple of developers who are asking for clarification in terms of both the um, how to price and qualify um, individuals uh, for uh, both the rental and the owner occupied. Um, and um, it, it, the language in the ordinance wasn't clear enough to give specifics. Um, and so this is an attempt to clarify. Um, how uh, the housing, how the town uh, is going to tell um, uh, property management companies, developers, and future um, homeowners who are selling their home, which are restricted by these, these covenants, how they're going to be able to price their home and to whom they are going to uh, be required to sell it, under what conditions. And so the, the, um, uh, they're really two different um, types. One is the owner-occupied, where you're selling the home, uh, and the other one is, is rental units, and they're slightly different um, for a couple of reasons. Um, for the, the first consideration is that these are really, these aren't the, the professionals, um, these aren't the uh, government organizations or the, the NGOs that are um, in the business of, um, 
uh, producing, selling, and renting uh, affordable housing. This is, this is really um, the, the general public, the, the laity. So, so uh, we didn't want to be overly burdensome in terms of how um, we would be requiring uh, the individuals to be um, qualified. And so the, the first thing that we were saying is that um, a qualifying family uh, for the purpose of owner-occupied is one that makes less than 80% of the medium area income of a four-person uh, four family. Um, and the, the reason there was that we, we felt it was going to be really hard for uh, individuals to um, quantify or, or validate uh, who is in their household and who is intended to be there. Um, and so that's why we kind of settled on the, the family of four and saying if they make less than uh, the uh, Portland, South Portland MSA uh, annual median family income for a family of four, 80% of that, excuse me, because this is the, the affordable covenant, um, that they would, that family would then qualify to purchase that home. Um, in, in 2018, that number is um, $72,000. Um, so as long as the individual who's person purchasing the home makes less than that, uh, they qualify. Uh, the next component uh, was really around um, the pricing of, of the home. Um, and um, the, the next two sections, the first one says that um, uh, the, the language that's being included is that um, it also has to be inclusive of homeowners and, and condominium associations, because uh, that was on there. So it's, it's the full... Um, mortgage for principal and interest, um, it's uh, their um, insurance premium, the real estate taxes, um, the fees, and then a reasonable estimate for water, sewer, heat, hot water, and electricity. That all has to be less than 30% of the monthly income um, that the uh, that qualifying family would be able to afford. So it has to be, that comes out to, eight, if using the $72,000 number, that comes out to $1,800 a month for the mortgage, the insurance, um, the condominium association fees, uh, oh, also real estate taxes, um, and then the, um, the last section was kind of where we addressed that what we didn't want was a, a just the, um, the obligation being met by studio apartments and one-bedroom apartments. Um, so um, basically what we said was in that third clause is that if you do a one-bedroom or less, um, that you ha you can you would have to price it at, at the um, you would have to price it based upon the forty excuse me the the one um, ha person household um, and then if you have two bedrooms or more you can use the four person household um, so the first section was about qualification this is where we're talking about pricing um, and then so the the four person would then be the eighteen hundred dollars a month would have to pay. Uh, all of those uh, costs, um, if it was a one bedroom or less, it would then have to be the 30% um, of the, uh, the one person median income um, number, which I think was around like 53,000. I didn't, I didn't use, put that number. Um, the, uh, if you do the calculation on the, on the $1,800 a month, uh, you know, it comes out to something on the order of a two hundred eighty thousand dollar home or, or three hundred thousand dollar home. The the uh, alliance was going to get together and try and put together some uh, really simplified worksheets so that we could then be able to provide them when at, so the town would be able to provide them when asked by uh, future homeowners or developers uh, for owner occupied. Um, the rental we felt was a little bit different because we could um, for two reasons. One. Uh, we would have better insight into the actual number of people in the household. So, so I believe the, qualif the qualifying at this point is actually based on your household size, um, as well as the idea is not to kick people out if they make more than, uh, if they get a raise. So if you're making 79% of the area median income and you get a raise, you don't lose your, your housing right away. Um, the, so, however, they, they would no longer qualify if, um, they exceed 140% of the area median income for their household size. Uh, and then the, the rent qualification is still the same around what has to be included. Thank you. Complicated. Uh, this will be sent to the planning board, and so it'll be uh, subject to further public review.
public, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, public comment. See none, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Katie. I just have to say thank you. It's, it's great yeah. work, and I just I love the clearness of it. Um, it has always felt like a, a topic that has been ambiguous and mm -hmm. hard to kind of grapple with and understand, and this feels like clear and out there, and people know what it is. Comments? Uh, it, 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 trying to make rules for affordable housing is very tricky, and there, because every situation can be different. And that size of the household can be different. Uh, and, and so it can be a rental, could be a purchase. So uh, this was really brought to the attention of the Housing Alliance because developers were confused as to what their obligations were. And so now this is a good effort by one of our uh, committees to try and clarify it for us. Chris. Yeah, just a quick question to Council Rohn, if I could. Do you, do you think this will help? kind of spur influence or spur, spur engagement, I guess, with our uh, ability to draw new projects here? Does this give the kind of clarity that people are looking for, or is it uh, just a more of an administrative function? Well, I, I really hope so. I think what, what really was disappointing was earlier this year, we had a developer that really wanted to build an affordable unit to sell, mm -hmm. and we weren't able to give them guidance. Um, okay. And it, we really, really struggled with it for a long time. It's really, really hard to, to uh, make sure that you know, for, for that realtor to be able to market a property, find a buyer, and then have that buyer qualify for the mortgage, it's a really tricky right. nut. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's really more to, uh, there, there's still a fair amount of um, develop, developments that are in progress that have taken the affordability bonus that haven't um, yet met that obligation. And so this will help them, mm -hmm. hopefully. And then we also have the uh, the Crossroads District, which has the uh, which is planning to do a, a mixture of both types. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, I hope that it will help um, draw more affordability. I mean, we're, we're I, I, you know, we're definitely below our goal, I believe. Okay. Just Good. if I could, for my part, being the one who will likely whose phone will ring when questions come, <laughs> I'm very thankful to have um, not only this, but then the uh, associated worksheets, and that will be the subject of discussion at the next alliance meeting. Is really simplifying and having forms that people can use and put to practice. Uh, we are blessed to have two very talented affordable housing professionals on the Alliance that were frankly invaluable to help uh, navigate these waters. Absolutely. Great. Great. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, order uh, 1856, act on the request to authorize acceptance of $1,000 or any portion thereof to be placed in the asset forfeiture account and to authorize the town manager to sign any and all necessary documents. This money is the police department's equitable share for its contribution to the investigation of criminal cases. And Chief Moulton is here with us this evening. First off, I'd like to say thank you to, uh, to the council for giving our public safety ad hoc committee the opportunity to provide an update today. They've worked really hard, and we have a really robust uh, committee, and um, I'm very pleased with the progress and, and all the support. Uh, secondly, I, I need to uh, apologize to Mr. Hall. Um, normally when we do this, I provide a memo that kind of explains a little bit about the case, and, and uh, I realized tonight when I picked up my packet to come here that although I said in my email that I was attaching it, it was not attached. So I will uh, I'll be Spam happy filter. to forward that along for the record uh, tomorrow. Um, basically in, uh, in October of 2017, uh, Maine Drug Enforcement Agents observed a person acting suspiciously in a known drug area of Portland. Uh, the agents had reason to believe that the person had just purchased heroin. They were able to apprehend the person and, uh, uh, who was found to be a low-level drug user. He uh, volunteered the source of his drugs rather than face criminal charges for possession of heroin. And with that information, the agents immediately located the residence of the suspected dealer, a John Davis of High Street in Portland, and observed him outside of his residence. They were able to take him into custody without incident. 
Um, while, uh, while searching Davis, our officer located $790 in cash on, on his person in various pockets, along with a small quantity of heroin package for individual sale. And with that new information, they applied for and received a search warrant for his residence. And uh, upon search of the, the apartment, they found an additional $5,000 in cash and uh, six grams of heroin individually packaged in 26 plastic baggies for sale. So they seized a total of $5,790 in cash, six grams of heroin with a street value of $900. Uh, charged that individual and convicted uh, for felony trafficking. And uh, as a result, the, uh, the AG's office has given us the paperwork. Uh, once this case was resolved, our, our cut of that will be about $1,000. Thank you. Questions for the chief, Chris. So I, I think chief, isn't it, is this a result of us being part of that regional coalition or the administrator for that? So it wasn't necessarily anything that happened right in Scarborough, but because of our Correct. involvement in that task force, we're receiving a benefit from that. Correct. We okay. have an officer assigned to uh, to yep. Maine Drug Enforcement, and yep. he participated actively in that in that investigation. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for the chief? Thank you, chief. Uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to address this matter? Approach the podium. Seeing none, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? None. Uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, uh, item nine standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, Want to start down your end, Chris? Uh, yeah, it'll be a short report because transportation met July 4th, energy July 20, uh, sorry, July 24th, uh, energy July 25th. Uh, I was out of town on work that week, so I missed both of those. Long range planning has met July 26th, August 3rd, August 9th. I was out of town on work for all of those as well. Uh, however, uh, the work continues in spite of my uh, thoughts that I am irreplaceable. Uh, that, that is clearly not the case by any stretch of the imagination. Um, long range planning wanted to wanted me to um, really encourage people uh, and remind people of the comprehensive plan presentations that are going up on tomorrow. Uh, they are at 7.30 a.m. and at 6.30 p.m. and I believe both are here in, in at Town Hall. This will be your first opportunity to have public input and, and get an idea of the rough draft or the first draft of the comprehensive plan, uh, the first of many opportunities, but certainly uh, the earlier you engage and the more active you are, the, 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 the better we can react and the more time we have to adjust the program and the plan uh, to, to what the community is looking for. Uh, and also there is an open house from 4.30 to 6.30, uh, also here, I believe, uh, as well. Uh, and that's more of an informal setting uh, instead of a presentation where you can come in and ask questions um, kick the tire, so to speak, and, and, and uh, see what's on, the, on the, the preliminary plan. So I don't think I've missed anything. If I have, um, I think uh, town manager certainly will, will, will backfill, but that's all I have. Coach Hayes. Yeah, just a couple quick ones. Um, Coastal Harbor Committee met. They're actually working on a mooring, mooring ordinance. It's been out there for a while. They, they will have a new draft in September, hopefully bring it back here on October or late September. Um, they're also asked some questions around reserve funding type model. Tom and I have had some conversations and suspect we may have something for, to propose. Shellfish Met, they are also working on a new license ordinance um, to kind of deal with some of the issues that we've had in the past. Finance Committee meeting, we're, we're trying to find a date that works in the next two weeks. Um, we've had some, some schedule conflicts along the way. We will be meeting, we'll be talking about um, financial modeling that we've been also working on for a couple of years and may take up some of the conversation on the, the Scarborough, Scarborough Downs TIF that we talked about, just some, some questions that we may have as, as we start to have the conversation. So I guess with that, that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Councilor. Oh. Um, yep, so the Eastern Trail Alliance uh, continued to be very active all summer with several different events. Um, that group has kind of splintered a little bit in terms of the work group who's managing kind of the project in terms of uh, connecting the gap, um, which I have not been as active a participant of, um, but I know that they're making progress. Mr. Hall could probably fill you in a little bit more on that. And then uh, the Conservation Commission met on Monday. Unfortunately, uh, I was not there, but I do know, and I've touched base with, I think five of us, five or seven of us anyway, around plastic bags. 
and it is something they want to uh, start talking about more seriously. So if people have any major questions or concerns, it's really not uh, something new anymore. It's almost all the surrounding communities have adopted some kind of uh, policy around plastic bag usage. So that is something they're very interested in pursuing. Um, and so please get, let me know if you have con questions or concerns around that. And then they were working diligently Monday to review their piece of the um, comprehensive plan. But I don't have an outcome of that. Thank you. Councilor Rowland. Yes, thank you. The Affordable Housing Alliance uh, met on uh, the 25th of July. Unfortunately, I had in my head that they were meeting on the 26th of July, uh, and uh, uh, I missed that meeting. Uh, but at that meeting, they discussed the language that you saw um, and vo uh, approved tonight, um, and they um, were also briefly discussed um, modifications to the affordable housing in Luffy, um, but they really didn't have enough time. That's going to carry over into their next meeting. Um, which I believe is next week, and I'm going to double check with the chairman uh, or the chair before uh, I move. Uh, but I believe it's next Wednesday. Yes. Uh, and then we're also going to work on um, the worksheets as well. So. Good. Thank you. Councilor Beba. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question, and I apologize to uh, Councilor Hayes. The uh, August 21st meeting has been rescheduled to August 29th, correct? Maybe. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Just want to make sure. <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. it was today. It's, 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 I, I just want to make sure it's not 21st August twenty first. Twenty first is off. Okay. It, it is. It is. Was rescheduled to 29th. Okay. Uh, we can pick. Chris, okay. I just want to make sure. Chris's schedule is in flux, so we will. Okay. Revisit. Guilty as all. Uh, we can agree on everything, Peter. You and I, and we'll get it all done. <laughs> um, I did want to mention that the library um, has their uh, annual strategic retreat on Thursday that I'll be attending from one to five. Um, and I did want to give a shout out to them and um, thank them. They have been a cooling station over the past couple weeks or at least month um, that has been a, a, a wonderful um, space uh, for many citizens to go and um, be more comfortable than being outside. So I do want to say thank, thanks to Nancy Crowell for that. Uh, cable TV committee meeting is, I believe, meeting next Tuesday. Um, I need to confirm that. We do have two um, openings on that still. And did want to mention that the appointments committee will be meeting um, just prior to the next council meeting and uh, we do need to meet because we do have um, some appointments that need to be taken care of and we're still uh, working on the analysis regarding um, uh, the evaluation process for a town manager and compensation analysis in the market thank you if yes. I, sorry if I could through the through the chair just a uh, reminder we probably will have a <coughs> workshop uh, and yes. it might be difficult for me to get here before Okay. Five of five fifteen ish. Okay. So um, if it's if it's urgent, I certainly will try and make adjustments. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, town manager report. Yes, a couple of things. Uh, Councilor Chiazza covered most of the big things in the comp plan. I did want to just add a couple of details, though. Uh, I would characterize this draft of the plan as really kind of the consultant's plan, if you will. This is what um, they've synthesized all the input to date. They've put it down on paper, and so now it's really our opportunity um, to have our way with it and make it our plan. Uh, we heard some comments this evening that um, it misses the mark in certain areas, so I really encourage folks to spend time to look through it, and uh, let's make it our plan and make it useful um, for us. As part of this, we've been undertaking a survey for the past month or so, three weeks. We've had over 500 responses, uh, so we'll be collating those responses and sharing those out. Um, shortly. And of course the plan is always available on our town website or the scarboroughengage.org website. Um, and there's an opportunity for comment portal through that means as well. So you needn't necessarily come to these public events. There's opportunity for input uh, at, at your convenience. Uh, the FEMA flood maps I've reported in the past, uh, we are officially in the appeal period. That period is due to expire September 10th. The town is meeting with its consultant, excuse me, September, October. October. Ah. Wrong month, wrong day. <laughs> I thought you told me September 10th today. I beg your pardon. That's so your fault. Though. October 30th. <laughs> yeah. uh, Jay and I are meeting with our consultant this Friday to finalize a, our a scope of work. Uh, we intend to file a, a, an appeal on behalf of uh, a number of affected parties, hundreds, frankly. Uh, individuals are able to file their own appeal. Uh, I do 
have to note, though, that there must be technical grounds. It's not as, it's not enough to say, I've lived here 40 years and it's never flooded. You know, your map's wrong. Um, so uh, it, it's a fairly structured process, and there needs to be technical support for that claim. If I may, uh, how effective are those appeals? Do we do you typically they re well received and, and adjusted, or are they? Is it just a, for sake of putting it in the file and saying yes, we've we've, we've objected, so noted. Here I'm, it is. I'm not sure if I can offer a, an honest opinion about that. Okay. Um, I, I think you need to listen carefully and have those technical grounds, probably yep. with a consultant to help support you. Yep. Uh, even once the maps are finalized, there is always a process to further amend that map. It's a little okay. more complicated, perhaps. Okay. Uh, so if folks intend to, they probably ought to try to do it in the appeal period. Uh, you heard a long presentation uh, or update on the public safety building, uh, the three homes the town owns. Uh, we did go out uh, through an RFP process to see if anyone was interested in relocating those homes. Unfortunately, there were no takers. We did have a number, actually only one resident, indicate interest in some of the contents, or I, not contents, but um, items and fixtures. Um, however, we did work with Habitat for Humanity. They came in with a work crew over two days and removed all sorts of interior items, uh, vanities and kitchen cabinets and interior and exterior doors. All told, it was about $3,400 in value at their restore. So the, uh, they'll be selling it and those proceeds will go back to their mission. And then one resident uh, did come in and pick up some of the other items. So at this point, um, we are uh, just caring for the property, making sure they're secure, and uh, we'll be looking at demolition as soon as that site work starts. I do want to announce that we've hired a new sustainability coordinator, mm -hmm. Jamie Fitch. Uh, Jamie will be making her rounds uh, to the various committees, and I think you'd be very pleased. Uh, she's no stranger to us. We work closely with her. In fact, I think she's probably presented to this council. She worked for the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District, and she was their public uh, outreach and education manager, and she's the one who led the training on the uh, stormwater permitting, you might recall. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, some Remitting. rapport with her. We're very pleased. I think her, her skills and talents will lend themselves very well to advancing some of our priorities. And lastly, Community Services has a big couple of days coming up. Um, the annual Summerfest is this Friday, 5 to 10 p.m. down here at the Sports Complex. Uh, I know a number of town departments uh, will be participating. It remains to be seen if we're able to, we'll have facilities for council should enough of you uh, be able to attend to the event. But if not, we certainly understand. Um, beyond that, um, the Memorial Park has received a number of upgrades over the last year or so, and we'd like to do a bit of a ribbon cutting or kind of a, a formal introduction to the community. Our two new pickleball courts are operational, as is the bocce court and the cornhole, which two uh, cornhole uh, games. Uh, the one remaining item will be uh, a shelter or a shade structure that uh, we're still working with the various committees on. Where, the, where that should be and what it should look like. But uh, in the meantime, we'd like to celebrate uh, the success of at least bringing these items on. Uh, that event will be Tuesday next week. That's uh, August 21 at 1 in the afternoon. So I'll build for Thank questions. You. Thank you. Any questions of the town manager? Uh, Councilor comments. Uh, who did we start with? We started with Chris uh, Sean. Um, a few items, actually. First, um, I wanted to recognize and congratulate former town councilor Carol Rancourt, who recently retired from SMA, Southern Agency on Aging, after 30 plus years. Um, she's always been a very strong advocate in Scarborough, serves on many, many committees. So I wanted to give her congratulations. She also served, I believe it was nine years on the school board. So uh, give her a shout out. Also wanted to say a happy birthday to school board member Jackie Perry. Uh, congratulations on that milestone. I um, also wanted to congratulate Ms. Ketch. Um, this is, it's been a very nice summer, not being around, but there's a lot to catch up. Um, and congratulated her on being named the interim principal, um, having been on the school board when she kind of was new to the dip, uh, new to the area as being a, a assistant principal. Um, I think she's highly qualified and a wonderful addition to the leadership team in that role. Um, Summerfest, I will be there. Won't be at a council um, council booth, but. Um, I think that in some time in the future, when I'm not on the council, we should have a dunk tank for councilors, um, <laughs> and I'd uh, be happy to pitch in, or maybe even the police chief and fire chief can be up there. Um, I did want to mention on a personal note, 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like most of us, I have a town council um, or a, a councillor page on Facebook. Uh, I was told, uh, I think it was the last evening or the night before, um, I was actually hacked. Um, so I've tried deleting it. Um, so if you do get requests, I never send out requests for, for friends on it. So if you do get one from me, please delete it, report it, spam it, whatever you can. It is not me. Um, I actually had a conversation with the hacker. It was kind of interesting, so, as well as several other people, by the way. Um, but uh, it's not me, so I've tried taking that down. Um, but uh, be, be careful out there. Um, and I did want to, and I, I, I forgot to write down the name of the survey, um, but I did want to congratulate the school department and our district in its recent uh, um, recognition of being ranked fourth in the state um, on it, the quality of education for our district. And I think that's a big shout out to the leadership team as well as the current school board and previous school board. So uh, thank you for the hard work. I um, wanted to mention that um, election papers are available. I hope everyone, um, especially those who get up and criticize and point out um, opportunities for us to change, that they step forward, uh, put their name on a ballot, because uh, that is the only way our democracy works at its best. Um, and it is rewarding no matter what you listen to and no matter what uh, you get out of it. It is wonderful. I've been doing it for many years. I believe, I'm not, I hope I don't say this wrong, absentee ballots can be requested. They, can't, they won't be mailed to you but they can be requested. I think they, the clerk sends them out 30 days before the election, but I hope people um, exercise that because it's an important election this year, whether it's at the state level, um, there is a referendum question on question one, but also at the local level. And then last, I did want to mention a couple of things. Um, one, I want, to, I want to thank about the workshop on the TIF, or at least on the, the progress of where we are. I think it's very informative, it's very necessary. Obviously, there's um, a lot of information that still needs to be shared. Um, and I really wanted to emphasize a couple of points that were made. First, is that I really think that we need to emphasize in the presentation as we engage the public, because I do agree that we need to bring them along. Um, I have a caveat to that. Um, one is that they, I think there needs to be a better understanding of how a TIF works and the benefit of that to the community as a whole, and that it's not associated with one particular project. There's been a lot of commentary, blogging, that this is somehow related just to a $20 million community center. And it's not. It's about the infrastructure, the redevelopment, or the development of this downtown district and the long-term vision of where we're going to be as a community. And it's tied into everything that's related to the project and not one particular aspect of it. So I hope that we emphasize that as part of the entire discussion because they need, it's always hard to kind of look beyond the scope of where you are in your own life. And you have to kind of think out what's going to happen in 50 years because that's really what this is about. Um, in this project, and it is, you know, it is the biggest thing. And um, what I also wanted to mention was that while I want to make sure the public um, is informed and is um, with us on this, there's also a responsibility of the town council to accelerate its own learning curve because we can't always wait for the public to be at that same level. That's what we're elected to do because timing is critical for any project. Um, and when you think about development, um, that timing is um, particularly impacted by seasonality of construction, um, economic markets, where you are you know, no, statewide, um, especially as the state talks about zero job growth over the next 10 years and how that impacts material costs and labor costs and everything else that we're talking about. So um, you know, timelines are important. I'm not saying that we need to rush anything, but I think that at the same time, we need to be mindful that um, it is all impacted by the demand of, of the consumer, or demand of the companies that want to come in and um, build because they want to build now. They're not waiting for some timeline. They need to build now. Um, and so I'm glad to see that they're interested in coming to Scarborough, but I hope that's all emphasized as we move forward because I'm excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Nothing tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Foley. Um, just that summer's waning, sadly, <laughs> and, uh, you know, enjoy it. We've got a couple of weeks left. I know I certainly haven't hit half my list, um, but uh, the school year will be here before we know it, so we can jump into full crazy mode then. That's it. That's it. Yeah, I was just going to echo that. It's the waning part of summer. we got a couple of weeks left, so I hope everybody enjoys. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll okay, piggyback so. as well and say, I, while I, I wish I could have enjoyed the, the reduction in, in schedule for us this summer, uh, I've magically found a way to replace council meetings with other things, unfortunately. So uh, I still have a list, I think, somewhere. I, I don't know where it is, but, um, uh, but it, it's, it was kind of nice to dust the cobwebs off a little bit and re-engage the brain uh, for this stuff. And 
we got a lot of work ahead of us this year. Uh, comprehensive plan, um, public safety building, uh, never a dull moment in the wonderful town of Scarborough. So um, I'm looking forward to getting some of the heavy lifting done. It's going to be a big year. And even though it's not necessarily budget season, there are a lot of other things we need to focus our attention on. So I'm, I'm happy for that. Um, Summerfest, great opportunity, great community opportunity uh, to come out and participate, watch some fireworks, you know, meet your friends, talk about the comp plan. Um, I, I will be there, unfortunately, not at, at the council table, but, but certainly always available for any discussions or comments from anybody who chooses to approach. Uh, and last but not least, I wanted to um, bring up uh, uh, something on the website, our, our webpage, which I think is wonderful. The, um, thanks to Maine Public, they did a drone video of the town of Scarborough. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. And it's very professionally done, and they obviously we didn't have to pay for it, and they allowed us to put it up there. And if you had it, haven't had a chance to look at it yet, it's Beautiful. really amazing. And it just kind of puts into perspective, I think, the, the wonderful resources we have in town and the, and the great natural beauty and, and opportunities for, for just a quality of life that's really rare, I think. And I think we need to step back and appreciate that from time to time. And I certainly know I, I, I enjoyed it. It's only about four minutes long. Um, but it really hits the high points, and it's, it's really a good look if you get an opportunity. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, summer and at, at, at Higgins Beach and at Pine Point, that means that we have our many Canadian visitors, uh, and uh, many of whom own homes here, pay taxes, have been here for decades and decades and decades. Uh, uh, recently, there really has been some harsh rhetoric out of Washington about Canada and Canadian Prime Minister, which I thought was really regrettable. And it got me thinking that I wanted to honor our Canadian friends uh, by telling you a little bit about a Scarborough home homeowner from Canada. Uh, and he lived across the street from me by the name of Jim O'Reilly. Uh, and he became a lawyer in the late 1960s when he also acquired his home on Morning Street, still owns it, comes every year for months. Uh, in the early 1970s, the James Bay uh, Hydro Dam Project began, and it's the largest hydro dam project in the world at that time and remains one of the largest. Uh, and then at that time, uh, it was proposed to consume thousands of acres of tribal land of the Cretes and the Inuits. And no compensation, no consideration, just gone. Uh, well, I've never known anyone who actually made it into Wikipedia. And I'll read you from the James Bay litigation uh, Wikipedia site. The Quebec Association of Indians, an ad hoc association of native northern Quebecers, won an injunction on 15 November 1973 blocking the construction of the hydroelectric project. They were represented by their lawyer, James O'Reilly, who became one of the foremost experts in Indian law. The governments of Canada and Quebec and representatives from each of the Cree villages and, the, and most of the Inuit villages signed the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement on November 11, 1975. The agreement offered for the first time a written contract which explicitly recognized the rights of indigenous people. Pretty cool. <laughs> That was James O'Reilly, and he's still representing these people today. Wonderful man. So, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. Will Rowan gets his first one of the year. <laughs> it is.